Hello everyone, my name is Jeremiah Blocky, and I'm excited to tell you about our paper, DA Hash, Distribution Aware Tuning of Password Hashing Cost. So this is joint work with my student, Wenji Bai, also at Purdue University. So let's, uh, let's start off by motivating the problem of offline attacks. Um, so here I am uh, registering at PlayStation.com uh, with my username and password, 123456. Uh, what happens when I register? Uh, well, PlayStation will pick a random value called the salt, and then they'll compute the cryptographic hash of my password, uh, concatenating or prepending the cryptographic salt, and they'll store this hash value on their server. Okay, um, so later if I log in, uh, they can recompute this hash value, check to see that the hash is matched, and uh, um, if they do, then they can authenticate me. Now, what can go wrong? Well, uh, due to you know, misconfigurations at PlayStation.com, an attacker might be able to break into the server and uh, steal this cryptographic hash file. At this point, the attacker can mount an offline attack. There's no way to rate limit the attacker. The attacker can guess as many uh, passwords as he want. wants. Uh, there's no way to stop the attacker. The attacker is only limited by the cost of uh, checking more and more passwords. So in this case, the attacker can loop through a dictionary of uh, likely password guesses and just check all of them. As soon as they find a hash that matches, uh, they've got my password. So offline attacks are a common problem. Password breaches at major companies have affected billions of user accounts. Uh, so we can see here an incomplete wall of shame with uh, companies like LastPass and Ashley Madison and Yahoo responsible for millions or even billions of uh, password breaches. Now, unfortunately, uh, offline attacks are a very dangerous problem. The challenge is that many users select passwords that are weak and are easy for the attacker to guess. So shown over on the right here, we have a word cloud which shows popular password distributions from the RockU breach. So a little bit of notation uh, we'll introduce right off the bat. Uh, uh, given a password, we'll write the probability uh, that a random user selects that password. And then we'll denote lambda of b to be the probability mass of the top b passwords in this password distribution. Now, the password distribution might be unknown, uh, but we have lots of samples from it. So how do we protect passwords against this dangerous threat? Well, one defense is to apply key stretching. right? So many password hashing algorithms take as input a cost parameter, which controls the cost of computing this hash function. The idea is we want to intentionally make this hash function more expensive to compute to deter an attacker from cracking passwords. One way to do this is just hash iteration. Instead of computing the hash value, iterate this hash function k times. Um, another way to do this is to design a password hashing algorithm that's memory hard. So uh, force the attacker to allocate large amounts of memory for the entire duration of computation. Uh, so this is the more modern way to do password hashing. Now, what does a rational attacker do uh, when facing uh, key stretching? Well, we're going to model an attacker whose goal is to maximize profit, being profit being given by expected reward and expected guessing costs. Now, expected reward is dependent on the value of a cracked password, v, and the password distribution, right? So expected reward is the value of a cracked password times the probability that you actually crack that password within the B guesses. Similarly, expected guessing costs are dependent on the hash cost parameter as well as the user password distribution. Now the attacker faces a trade-off. Checking more passwords increases the expected reward, but also increases the expected guessing cost. So at the end of the day, the attacker wants to pick a budget B, which is going to maximize profit. Now the defender's goal is to minimize the number of cracked passwords. Intuitively, to achieve this goal, we can increase the guessing cost, right? So increase the hash cost k. This will encourage the attacker to crack fewer and fewer passwords. Unfortunately, the defender faces a fundamental trade-off. If he wants to increase costs for the attacker, necessarily he's increasing his own hashing cost. So we might wonder, is all this extra work, hashing passwords, actually work, worth it? Will it actually help deter a rational attacker from cracking user passwords? Well, on the one hand, uh, we might be tempted to say no. Many passwords are so weak that even if the hash cost is very large, the attacker is still going to crack them. So passwords like password or 12345 or let me in, 
are just so popular that an offline attacker is almost always going to check these uh, passwords, even if the hash cost is relatively large. On the other hand, some passwords are strong enough that even if the hash cost is small enough, an attacker is unlikely to crack these passwords, right? Uh, so if we pick four random words or if we pick a long random string, even if the hash costs are pretty low, it's still not going to be worthwhile for the attacker to crack these passwords. But on the other hand, we have marginal passwords. So these are moderate strength passwords where increasing the guessing cost might actually impact the attacker's decision, right? So if the cost of hashing this password is small, it's going to be worthwhile for the attacker to check this password. On the other hand, if the guessing cost is quite large, then the cost of uh, computing this hash function might actually exceed the expected reward from checking this password. And in this case, the attacker will give up and stop, uh, stop checking passwords. So motivated by these observations, we propose a solution called DA hash. Uh, here, DA stands for distribution aware. Um, and of course, the defender's goal is to minimize the percentage of passwords that are cracked by a rational attacker, subject to some amortized workload constraint. So here's what a DA hash solution might look like. For weak passwords, we might have a low, uh, low cost. For strong passwords, we might have a low hashing cost. And for moderate strength passwords, we might have a high cracking cost. Now, in this case, an attacker almost certainly is going to check all of these, uh, all of these weak passwords. Not only are they weak, but the hashing cost is low. But the key observation here is that the attacker was going to crack these passwords anyway. Now, if we set the hash cost high for these moderate strength passwords, then the attacker is not going to crack these passwords. Uh, and similarly, uh, even though the hash cost is low for this last group, the attacker won't crack them simply because uh, these passwords are too strong. So uh, our basic idea or our basic insight is that uh, guessing costs should be dependent on the strength of the password. So let me introduce our DA hash mechanism. Let's start with the process of account creation. So here I am registering account again with uh, PlayStation.com. The first thing PlayStation will do is run a procedure called get hardness to get a hash cost parameter, k. Now the important thing to note here is that this hardness parameter is now a function of the actual password that I picked. After this, they'll pick the salt value as before. And then they'll hash my password uh, with a salt value. And they'll provide as input to the password hashing function uh, the cost parameter k. At the end of the day, they'll get this hash value h. And they'll store my username, the salt value, and this hash cost h. Uh, what they will do, though, is they will discard the hash uh, cost parameter k. right? So k is not actually stored on the server. OK, how does authentication work at this point? Let's suppose that I log in, or perhaps an attacker tries to log in on my behalf. In this case, let's suppose an attacker tries to log in with the incorrect password 654321. In this case, what PlayStation will do is they'll run get hardness on the input password uh, to get a hardness parameter k prime. Now, in this case, k prime might not match the original hardness parameter, and that's OK. But notice that if the password guess was correct, then the hardness parameter would have to match because get hardness is a deterministic function. At this point, uh, the authentication server will retrieve the, the record, retrieve the salt and the hash value. They'll compute the hash of the password guess along with the salt uh, using the same uh, hardness parameter k prime. And then they'll check to see if h prime matches the hash value that's stored on the server. In this case, the answer is no, so authentication will fail. Uh, but notice that uh, if uh, the password was correct, uh, that this hash would actually match and authentication would, su would succeed. OK, so our contributions in this paper are as follows. Uh, we first introduced the DA hash mechanism. Uh, we also introduced the Stackelberg game theoretic model uh, to model the behavior of a defender and an attacker. Uh, we give an efficient, greedy algorithm to compute the attacker's uh, best strategy. And then we also give an optimization uh, problem to tune the defender's best strategy. So in other words, a strategy to compute the optimal DA hash cost parameters. 
Then we perform an experimental evaluation of the DA hatch mechanism using nine empirical password data sets. Uh, and from each password data set, uh, we extract two distributions, an empirical distribution and a Monte Carlo distribution. Uh, we'll describe more, uh, more about each distribution later, but intuitively empirical distributions we use to evaluate the performance of DA hash when the value of a cracked password is small. And when the value is larger, we'll use Monte Carlo uh, distributions. Okay, so let's introduce our Stackelberg game theoretic model. So in a Stackelberg game, there's two parties, a leader and a follower. Uh, in this case, the, the leader um, or the authentication server moves first. The action of the authentication server is simply to pick the cost parameters. So the, um, the authentication server is going to pick, uh, um, pick a cost vector uh, where Ki controls the cost of passwords in group I. So intuitively, we can think of this get hardness function as outputting a group I, uh, where I ranges between one and tau. Um, so we can classify passwords into, let's say tau is three, weak, medium, and strong passwords. Uh, I tells us whether the password is weak, medium, or strong. And then for each of these groups, we'll have a different cost parameter. Okay, now of course, uh, we can't just pick an arbitrary cost uh, vector, otherwise we would set all the costs to be infinity. We have to pick these costs to, you know, subject to some amortized workload constraint. Uh, so here, uh, the constraint is that the average workload to hash a random user's password have to be less than or equal to Cmax. Uh, so here we just look at the probability that a random user's password uh, has cost Ki multiplied by, multiplied by Ki. If we sum that, uh, we get the expected workload to hash a random user's password. Okay. Uh, we can also add an optional fairness constraint. Uh, so we can add the constraint that for every uh, group, whether the password's weak, medium, or strong, that the hashing costs are at least k-min. So here we might set k-min to be, uh, for example, cmax over 10. And this ensures that uh, um, we can never set the cost parameter for any group to be too low. So we always have to provide some minimal level of protection for every password. Okay. So that's the, uh, that's the action space of the uh, leader or the server. Now, uh, the next party is the attacker. The attacker is the follower. And the follower gets to pick his move after observing the uh, action of the defender. So in this case, uh, the follower knows the password distribution. They can compute get hardness. So for any password, uh, they can get the hardness uh, parameter ki for that uh, password. And uh, then their action is to pick a budget and an ordering over passwords. And what this means is that they'll guess the first B passwords in their ordering pi and then stop their attack, right? So that's the action of the defender. Now, the attacker is going to succeed with probability, which will denote lambda pi B, where intuitively lambda pi B just denotes the cumulative probability mass of the top P, top B passwords in this order. Okay. So what does the attacker want to do? Um, the attacker wants to play a strategy that maximizes its, its utility. So what is its utility? Let's suppose it plays the action pi b. In other words, check the top b passwords in permutation pi and then stop. What's the utility of the attacker? Well, given a value v and cost parameter is k, the utility of the attacker is going to be v uh, times lambda pi b. In other words, the value of a cracked password times the probability it cracks the password, uh, minus its expected cost, right? So to get its expected cost, we'll look at the probability that the first i minus one guesses are wrong, times the cost of the ith guess, if we have to make that guess, then we'll sum up over all guesses from i equals one to b, and that gives us our expected guessing costs, right? So the goal of the attacker is to find a strategy pi star and b star which maximizes this, uh, this utility function, right? So pi, pi star and b star maximizing utility. What about the defender? Well, the defender's goal is to minimize the percentage of cracked passwords. So the utility of the defender is going to be uh, the negation of lambda pi star b star. So in other words, uh, um, the inverse of the uh, number of cracked passwords. Uh, now here, pi star and b star are just the attacker's optimal strategy in response to the defender's action k. Right, so the defender picks a cost vector k, 
uh, and uh, uh, the attacker responds in a utility optimizing manner. Uh, and then we compute the uh, percentage of passwords that are cracked by this attacker, which would be uh, lambda pi star b star. So the task of the defender now is to find a cost vector which maximizes utility, in other words, minimizes the percentage of cracked passwords, subject to a feasibility constraint. So subject to a constraint that the amortized server workload can't be too large. So the first step, of course, before we can even ask uh, you know, how to optimize the defender's utility, uh, the first step is to actually compute the attacker's optimal response. Before we can come up with a good uh, strategy for the defender, we have to be able to predict how the attacker will respond. Now, the challenge here when we're trying to compute the attacker's optimal response is that there's exponentially many possible orderings for the attacker to crack passwords in. What ordering will the attacker pick? Well, uh, oh, yeah, so intuitively, yeah, just to summarize, uh, given the cost vector k, uh, the attacker responds with a utility optimizing strategy, uh, and our goal is to minimize the percentage of cracked passwords when the attacker responds rationally. Okay, so now the question is, how do we compute the optimal strategy for the attacker? Well, uh, we have to find the optimal ordering for the attacker to check passwords in. Uh, and to do this, we introduce something we call the bang for buck ratio. So this ratio for a particular password uh, is the probability that the password guess is correct, normalized or divided by the guessing cost for that password. So we'll call this the bang for buck ratio. And we say that a checking sequence pi has an inversion with respect to the cost vector k. If for some pair a and b, uh, we have r of pi a greater than r of pi b. So in other words, we're checking password pi b first, even though the bang for buck ratio is higher for password pi a. Right? If, th if that ever happens, then we'll call this an inversion. And our theorem here, uh, and we prove this formally in the paper, I'm not going to prove it now, is that the optimal strategy for the attacker doesn't contain any inversions. Right? Uh, intuitively, uh, right, swapping the order, uh, if we have an inversion, swapping the order in which we check these passwords can only increase the attacker's utility. OK, good. Uh, so now this gives us a, a natural strategy to compute the attacker's best response. Uh, we'll just take a greedy approach, sort passwords by their bang for buck ratio, and then order them uh, to find uh, the optimal ordering pi star. And now at this point, we can loop over all possible values of the budget B to find the optimal uh, budget B star for the attacker. So we have a few tricks to improve the efficiency. Given a compact representation of the distribution, see the paper if you're interested in details. Um, sometimes, uh, um, you know, sometimes looping over all budgets B might be a little bit expensive, but uh, we can improve that for compact distributions. Okay, so now what does the server do? Um, knowing that the uh, attacker will respond optimally, uh, the server has the following optimization problem. Right, given the value of a cracked password for the attacker, given a workload constraint Cmax and a uh, parameter Kmin, um, also given you know the password distribution and uh, a function get hardness, which classifies uh, you know uh, the strength of each password, we have the following variables that we want to optimize: k1 to k tau, right, where ki is the cost uh, for a group i, right, and intuitively the optimization problem is to minimize. Uh, the fraction of cracked passwords, subject to a couple constraints. Uh, right, so minimize the attacker's success rate. Uh, the first constraint here is saying that the attacker responds optimally. Right, uh, so pi star b star actually has to be the attacker's best response. So the utility of pi star b star has to be, uh, you know, at least the utility of any other strategy. And then the second constraint uh, is the amortized server workload constraint. So on average, the work to hash a uh, password can be at most Cmax. And then this final constraint is just saying that uh, you know, we have to provide a minimum level of protection for all groups. And then our goal is just find, uh, find some solution, k star, which uh, um, minimizes uh, the attacker success rate uh, or maximizes our utility equivalently.
Okay, so that's the optimization problem. Uh, now let's, uh, let's look at an empirical evaluation of DA hash. So to evaluate DA hash, uh, we rely on nine uh, large password data sets. Many of these password data sets are from uh, prior password breaches, uh, though several of them, like Yahoo, for example, uh, um, were actually collected uh, ethically with, uh, um, with permission from the companies. Um, so in, in the case of Yahoo, we don't actually have user passwords. We only have uh, password frequencies. But for the Yahoo frequency corpus, uh, this frequency corpus is derived from uh, n equals 70 million user passwords. Um, and re really what we can do is for each of these data sets, we can view uh, these data sets as giving us n independent samples from an unknown password distribution. So now the question is to tune uh, you know, our DA hash parameters, we need to actually have a, uh, a password distribution. So what password distribution should we use? Well, the first uh, solution we use is just to use the empirical distribution. So here we're going to define the probability of password I is just fi, the frequency of the ith most common password in the data set, uh, divided by n, the total number of passwords in the data set. Right, so in this case, we'll just take the empirical distribution and we get a distribution. So one advantage of this approach is that it's simple and uh, uh, it provides us with an accurate estimation uh, of the distribution uh, when we have uh, small to moderate uh, values V. So in other words, for moderately large guessing budgets B, uh, lambda pi or lambda B is equal to lambda hat B. Here, lambda of B is the probability mass of the top B passwords in the real distribution, which happens to be unknown. And lambda hat B is the empirical distribution. Now, the disadvantage is that uh, um, as this budget uh, uh, gets larger and larger, so as the value of the correct password gets larger and larger, uh, this estimation becomes less and less accurate. Um, so our solution here is uh, um, to use good Turing frequency estimation. And we'll use this as just a way to highlight regions of uncertainty, right? Uh, so if this difference between uh, you know, empirical distribution and uh, real distribution might be large, we'll just highlight that region of the curve as an uncertain region and uh, focus on regions of the curve where we're uh, fairly certain that the empirical distribution closely matches the real one. Okay. Now, of course, uh, as V gets large, uh, we can't really use the empirical distribution anymore to evaluate performance. Uh, so what we do instead is we uh, derive uh, a distribution uh, from empirical password cracking models. So what we do is we subsample passwords from each data set. Uh, then we uh, extract guessing numbers from a service called the Password Guessing Service run from run at CMU. Uh, and this guessing service uses a number of sophisticated password cracking models like neural networks, Markov models, probabilistic context-free grammars, John the Ripper, and Hashcat to uh, extract the uh, guessing numbers or a prediction of how many guesses it would take to crack that password. And after we've got, uh, you know, got these guessing numbers, we can plot our guessing curve. And then all we're going to do is we're going to fit a distribution to this guessing curve. Uh, so the advantage of this approach is it allows us to evaluate DA hash for larger values V. And, uh, you know, it might also be an accurate model of, you know, uh, how the attacker actually approaches password cracking. Uh, the disadvantage, of course, is that uh, um, we have to optimize or define this distribution with respect to a specific password cracking model. Of course, if the attacker develops a better or more sophisticated uh, password cracking model, then it's possible we optimize our DA hash parameters with respect to the wrong distribution. OK. Uh, so. Uh, in our experiments, what we do is we fix the password distribution D um, and the parameters V and uh, C, so the uh, server workload parameter and the uh, attacker value parameter. And then we run our optimization problem to optimize our DA hash parameters. And uh, we use a black box optimizer called ByteOpt to, to solve, uh, solve this optimization problem. Uh, then uh, once we've computed our DA hash parameters, uh, we run our greedy algorithm to compute the attacker's best response, as well as the percentage of cracked passwords. And then we just repeat steps one to three uh, for different value to cost ratios, uh, V over C max. And what we end up plotting is the percentage of cracked passwords versus this value to cost ratio. So let's look at some example results. Um, so shown here, 
are our results for the empirical distribution derived from the rock u uh, password breach. And we have a couple curves here. Uh, so on first of all, on the y-axis, we've got the fraction of cracked passwords. On the x-axis, we've got the value to cost ratio. Uh, so as uh, plotted in log, uh, log scale, so as we go to the right, uh, the value of a cracked password is getting higher and higher. Um, okay, so this first uh, black curve here, this is the baseline curve, right? So this is the percentage of passwords that the attacker will crack if we don't use DA hash. So in other words, if uh, the cost of cracking every password is exactly Cmax, right? And in this case, we get, uh, um, you know, uh, get a get the top plot. Uh, the the red plot is what we obtain if we use DA hash with uh, three strength groups. So tau is equal to three. So we divide passwords into weak, medium, and strong. Uh, we can also divide passwords into five groups, uh, like uh, very weak, uh, weak, uh, moderate, strong, very strong. And we get, uh, in this case, a different uh, cracking curve. And shown here, the other plots uh, just show the improvement. Uh, so here we can see uh, at this particular uh, value to cost ratio, we get a 13% improvement. Uh, so the percentage of cracked passwords uh, when we used DA hash uh, was 13% lower than uh, the percentage of passwords that were cracked without, uh, without DA hash. Uh, now over here, uh, uh, we're highlighting regions of the curve where we're uncertain about the, uh, the distribution, right? So this highlights regions where the empirical distribution might significantly diverge from the real distribution uh, and we're using uh, um, heuristics based on uh, a good Turing frequency estimation to, to highlight these uncertain regions. So see the paper for, for more details. Okay, um, here's another, uh, another plot uh, with a different password data set. Here we see a 15% improvement. Okay, so it's also interesting to look at uh, what happens as, uh, um, as the value to cost ratio increases. Uh, so what we can see over here is we uh, decided to look at which passwords are actually cracked. Uh, so we can see first the attacker starts to crack the weak passwords, then they start to crack the uh, medium strength passwords, and then afterwards they uh, start to crack the strong passwords. And over here we can see how the uh, hash cost vector changes over time. Right? So initially we're allocating almost all of our effort to uh, protect the weak passwords. At some point it becomes impossible to protect weak passwords right in this region and we start shifting our effort to protecting medium strength passwords um, and we continue to protect medium, medium strength passwords until until it starts to become worthwhile for the attacker to crack strong passwords um, and at this point we decrease the protection for medium strength passwords and start increasing our protection for uh, for medium strength for strong passwords right so as the value to cost increases uh, we start reallocating to protect the passwords that are right at the margin. Okay, yeah, so here, uh, weak passwords fully cracked first, then medium passwords, then all passwords are cracked, finally. Um, so we can also uh, repeat these this experiment for Monte Carlo distributions. Uh, here we can take V over Cmax uh, for, you know, guessing budgets that are much larger. And uh, we see similar improvements. So in this case, we see a 20% reduction in the uh, number of cracked passwords when we use DA hash. So in conclusion, uh, DA hash uh, um, is a mechanism we introduced to uh, reduce the fraction of passwords that would be cracked. Uh, the key insight here is that we focus key stretching on uh, passwords that are savable. Uh, so in this case, DA hash reduces the percentage of cracked passwords. Uh, by up to 15% or 20%, depending on which distribution we're, we're using. Uh, and it's compatible with modern hashing algorithms like memory hard functions. Uh, so I'll conclude there. Um, I can't take questions now, but I look forward to taking your questions during financial cryptography. All right, thank you. See you then.